Roastar coffee packaging found online at roastar.com prints great looking coffee bags for a host of your favorite coffee companies, companies of all sizes, that trust Roastar to produce packages worthy of their specialty coffee beans. It's Roastar's mission, their ethos, to help their customers tell their stories, big or small. That includes those of you roasting coffee at home. If you're a small roaster wanting to share your coffee with friends and family, Roastar will support you too. Head to Roastar.com to learn more about their quick turnaround times, digital printing, and smaller print runs. You can also use their design lab to create an entirely new package in the blink of an eye. In short, Roastar Coffee Packaging can help you. And on Roastar.com, you can start with a quote and end with the perfect coffee bag to share your story. Now, on to the show. Hey there, everyone. Welcome back to the Coffee People Podcast. I'm your host, Ryan Wolt. This show is presented by Roastar Coffee Packaging and is part of the Roast West Coast Coffee Network. Go to roastwestcoast.com to find recaps of this show, our Coffee Smarter podcasts, and so much more. This is a coffee and entrepreneurship podcast where we connect with guests who have some sort of connection to the coffee industry. We've been sharing the stories of roasters, baristas, farmers, scientists, artists, tech entrepreneurs, and more. We delve into entrepreneurship, motivation, inspiration, and we often do it with a great cup of coffee. Our guest today is Matthew Torres, the founder of Familiar Coffee, as well as the Long Beach Coffee Club in, you guessed it, the LBC, south of LA, in sunny Southern California. Familiar is unique in that their offerings are all specialty decaffeinated coffees. We're going to chat with Matthew about how he ended up heading down that path in just a moment. Until then, while you're listening today, be sure to click the links in this podcast show notes and follow at Familiar Coffee Co. on Instagram, or check out their current coffees on offer at FamiliarCoffee.com. You'll find those links in our newsletter at RoastWestCoast.com, which I hope you're signed up for. It comes once a week, and you can listen to this show right there. Man, my voice is just off today. I think it's time for a cup of coffee. I'm drinking, actually, a coffee that's near and dear to my heart, the Yeah No Yeah Coffee Collaboration that we here at Roast West Coast recently put out with our friends at Relative Coffee Company in Minneapolis, Minnesota. If you're a fan of Columbia and Ethiopia coffee blends, great coffees generally, or just Midwestern turns a phrase, I hope you'll join me someday soon in enjoying Yeah No Yeah Coffee. I'm clearly biased. I'm also really proud of this coffee effort and the collaboration with Relative's roaster, Brian Banker Scannell. Collaboration is a huge part of the Roast West Coast Coffee Network. And I'm off track. Wherever you are, I hope that your coffee is just as fine as mine. Because it is time to settle in and listen to another Coffee People podcast. This one featuring Matthew Torres of Familiar Coffee. Yeah, so my name is Matthew Torres. Um, the company I founded uh, just over a year ago is called uh, Familiar Coffee. We focused solely on decaf specialty coffee. Prior to that, I focused on a consumer-led coffee club based in Southern California called the Long Beach Coffee Club. That was uh, around like six, seven years of just learning and listening and facilitating. And yeah, then I live like a double life where I, uh, <laughs> for my day job, I'm a marketer for a huge tech company and a father, um, a husband, and do a lot of like things that I'm curious about. So um, yeah, I got really into uh, decaf coffee, and I'm sure we'll chat about that. But yeah, that's a bit about me. 
Uh, in honor of this conversation, I am drinking a decaf coffee, but I'm not going to add that specialty word to it. <laughs> it's, it is a decaf coffee that I had accessible today. Nice. The idea of specialty decaf, I feel like, is relatively new in the zeitgeist of, of even coffee people. This idea that you can get great craft specialty. And I am going to talk about that, but I want to go back in time a little bit further you mentioned the Long Beach Coffee Club. I think I saw that it started somewhere around 2016, 17. Mm -hmm. What was the impetus for that? What made, I mean, did you have an experience that made you think this is kind of, this is a community I want to be part of or help create? Yeah. So I'm originally from Los Angeles, from a small port town called San Pedro. Then I moved to the Sonoran Desert and lived there a decade while studying in Tucson. So I moved back to Long Beach, but really didn't have any community here. So I, I really was like searching for that in general. And I think that's like a foundational thing um, that will probably be a red thread throughout our conversation. And I moved around Southern California and finally found uh, Long Beach about 12 years ago. I started finding... Well, I found a, a coffee shop locally that introduced me to specialty coffee. And um, I, I started brewing coffee at home. And through that coffee shop, I would sit at the bar that was really similar to like a sushi bar where you can, you know, they serve you right on the countertop uh, and um, you have access to baristas and roasters and things along those lines. Wade was the owner of that shop called Lord Windsor. I would always talk to them because I would like I would read things online and then just bounce my ideas off of them. Mm -hmm. um, and right when we were getting to like the the, the cool part, I would uh, they would get pulled away because a customer would come in, and then I'm like, okay, like we we can pick up this you know tomorrow or you know something like that. And then it happened every time, and I started <laughs> thinking, you know, maybe there's other people like me that don't have the capacity to like kind of quit everything and jump into being a coffee professional, but that just love coffee and they're like enthusiast or, you know, whatever name we want to, we call them. So I launched a meetup that was just focused on coffee. Um, and it wasn't even specialty coffee. Um, it was just like coffee as a catch all. And then we would get, um, a mixture of people that would come in my goal, even in the beginning, was to get professionals that knew a lot about coffee and then coffee consumers and then try to be like the Venn diagram between the two and then um, just learn from each other. Because I think in the beginning, it was more of, you know, coffee professionals talking to consumers. And then after about a year, I realized that there was a lot of valuable conversations with feedback to the coffee industry because you, you don't often time like, you know, you're not like candid and unless somebody's like giving you a bad review to your face, which doesn't happen, <laughs> I hope not. You, you get like the, these conversations of like, hey, like I get really nervous when, you know, these cool looking people are at the register and ask me what I want. And um, what do you recommend I do? And they're like, oh, well, you know, first of all, you know, everyone's just working and having a good time. Um, but second of all, like maybe we can navigate the menu or you can ask these questions and that might kind of break the ice for a busy barista that's trying to get through their shift and trying to get your order quick, but also trying to give you good recommendations. So yeah, that's a bit about like Long Beach Coffee Club, the years of like us partnering. We partnered with uh, Blue Bottle and Gary Chow, who is the co-founder of Cafe Lux and just like a ton of different coffee for professionals, anything from, you know, what is cupping to uh, there was a lot of interest in latte art, which is fascinating because I had I'm more of like a brewer and like pour over person. We did those classes and even roasting, um, home roasting to production roasting. And it wasn't so much people wanting to, there was some that like were aspiring to be roasters, but more of just like the holistic view of like, what do you guys do and how do you guys do it? So it's kind of like a peek behind the curtain. So, yeah. You're doing that for several years into the pandemic, pandemic hits. I mean, you're doing 
<laughs> I hate to say this, but in my head, I was like, oh, he was doing in real life podcasts, which is not, it's actually the other way around. Everything's changed since the pandemic. I think about it differently, but you're also learning and you're growing in this community. While, like you mentioned, you have a whole nother life, uh, and a whole nother career. What pushed you to keep going? I mean, at some point, I have to think that it's getting to be kind of big and kind of, you know, time consuming, even if you're enjoying it, it's still this thing that's taking away from the rest of your life. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so I kind of, I, I definitely shifted the Long Beach Coffee Club to what it is today. I, I kind of like took a look at like, you know, what was the goals of Long Beach Coffee Club? And I, I, I honestly s sat down and said, like, could this be a business? Just because like, could I quit my day job? And could this be a business? And then after a lot of planning and research, and then, you know, leaning on like mentors, it just really didn't back out to something that like could sustain you, which was fine. And it helped kind of shift my perspective on, okay, you know, that common thing you hear from entrepreneurs of like, oh, you know, entrepreneurship is, you know, this golden thing that you can like work whenever you want. Um, I fell into a lot of that, those kind of podcasts of like masters of scale and hearing these romance stories or even these like, they're always wins, right? It's just like LinkedIn or these founders in, in a garage or, you know, that find this random or not random, but like focused success. So I looked at it and realized that like, this was going to be more of a hobby and just, you know, fun. And I got to learn a new industry that I had nothing like no foundational knowledge about. So when the pandemic hit, we tried to do something similar to like virtual meetups and, you know, those kinds of things, but it just didn't work. Um, we did like a, a sketch class where we drank coffee and then we had this amazing illustrator and then a couple other things. Then, you know, the idea for familiar started coming up and I had limited time of, you know, working a day job and then my personal life and doing all of these things. So I had to scale back Long Beach Coffee Club. So to answer your question is just, you know, I, I looked at like my finite amount of time and realize, you know, now Long Beach Coffee Club is what it is. And it's really just focusing on brewing coffee online, um, giving tips and tricks, and just trying to be as accessible as possible. So I like, kind of like the bare bones of like, what uh, we learned as a group. And then we might do an event or two a year. But it's really not anything. I was trying to do like two events a month um, when we were ramping up and then we kind of shifted gears. But yeah, I kind of deduced it down to what it is. So then I could work on other projects that um, I was curious about. You brought up two things there that I think are really important for anyone listening that is thinking about entrepreneurship or a business and coffee or you know, even understanding, you know, a lot of the guests on this show, which is one, that question, could this be a business and not just a hobby? Because those are two totally different things. And you'll feel differently about them, depending on which category it falls into. Something that you love as a hobby, you may not love as a business. So asking that question, I think is important. And the other thing you mentioned was finite amount of time. And that is such a, a tough thing, because as somebody who's starting something you care about, the thing you have the most of is your own time. Hopefully, you know, most people don't start with a bunch of money uh, if they do good for them and that's great, but most people have time to commit. And when you start thinking about what percentage of your life you're giving over to something, it, it has to become a business to keep, to keep down that path to can, to justify it. I just did a content calendar for one of my sponsors of, you know, the next 18 months. And I thought, oh my God, like who's doing all this work? <laughs> <laughs> There's so much work to be done. <laughs> yeah. gonna, I need some help. You mentioned familiar kind of started coming up and that was one of those things taking your, your time. Could you give us a quick primer? What is familiar coffee and why the focus on decaf? 
Yeah, so uh, Familiar, the original idea came up during the pandemic. It is a decaf only specialty coffee company. And we do a, it's just like a basic website, direct to consumer, and have like specific uh, pillars that are really important to us. And that is just quality. It's a great taste. So that's like probably one of the bigger North Stars. And um, I'll, I'll chat about kind of like the catalyst of like how that became so important. But design was really another like pillar for us just because um, I consume a ton of coffee globally from anywhere from you know, Copenhagen or Barcelona to Vancouver and, and like uh, regionally around the U.S. and then lots locally. Um, and I think uh, for consumers to really, I'm trying to think of a word that's not take you serious, but it's like <laughs> a, a succinct word for like, you know, we'll um, see that your quality isn't just, and, and no hate on like just a brown bag that's really minimal like the original kind of blue bottle thing but i think now with price point and um what's out there there has to be defining principles that set you apart so that was one of the bigger ones so you know when we're on a retail shelf or when a consumer finds us for the first time they're like oh this is a unique look at like a bag and a label and it's all of the different kind of aspects that, you know, are hopefully helpful. So, uh, and then the last is just like customer service. I think um, after finishing many books on just entrepreneurship and leadership and business in general, I think like the service uh, part of online businesses are kind of the make or break of like what separates you. That's another important aspect for me, but uh, familiar started with me uh, working at a startup during the pandemic, and I, I couldn't consume the amount of coffee that I was consuming prior to being kind of stationary at home. So my like three to four cups shifted really quickly to one to two cups um, due to mental health. And, um, through that, I was just like, okay, like I still want coffee because I'm so used to this. And it's one of the things that, you know, I, I really cherish in life. Um, so I just started ordering dozens and dozens of different bags and it would take me a little while to get through them, but I, I would want to go, okay, you know, I'm drinking, you know, Luna coffee or, or whatever caffeinated version, maybe they'll have a decaf. And that's where I started of like these coffees that were really um, delicious. Um, let me just start with the roasters I'd already enjoy. And then I started branching out um, because it wasn't the same quality. The taste really just tasted different. It kind of reminded me of you know, uh, when you have a Coca-Cola and then you're drinking a Diet Coke, you know you're drinking Diet Coke. So that's always like the metaphor of like, I know I'm drinking decaf coffee. And what if there was something that could trick my brain and say like, oh, this tastes like a normal coffee. That's really where the idea came from. I worked with a professional coach out of Copenhagen named Lash that really helped kind of push me of like, hey, sit down. This is like, you know, before you have kids, before, you know, you, <laughs> you life gets even busier. Um, I, this is a really important thing that you want to do. And it sounds like, you know, a passionate aspect of it. And we really, she helped kind of put a plan together for me and then had action items to have the dream to kind of move on it. And yeah, then, you know, it, it took a lot, a lot longer than I thought. Uh, I'll say that to, uh, to to get it off the ground. How did you start finding sourcing coffees that were decaf and had that that specialty craft taste that you were looking for? Where and the way I think of it is, if somebody sets a specialty coffee in front of me and then sets a decaf specialty coffee in front of me, I shouldn't really tell the difference. 
or I hope that I can't tell the difference yeah. between the two if they don't tell me which is which, right? How did you go about finding those first ones and go, that really made you go, oh, this is possible. I can do this. That was probably the longest process. I, I felt like in business, you talk about like your MVP, you know, for me to like the proof of concept, I needed to find a coffee that could do what you just explained, right? It's you can put it on a cupping table and somebody couldn't say, oh, that's definitely a decaf. You know, it could pass as like, oh, that's a really good coffee. And then they're surprised that's a decaf. So it was a lot of trial and error requesting samples. But to be honest, like I tasted this coffee from a roaster that I admired, which is black and white coffee roasters. And that was the, as I was building it, that was like the 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 coffee that I tasted that was like, wow, this this can't exist. You know, there's coffee out there that is that delicious. And that coffee was really special because it was an Ethiopian coffee that was a really great coffee as in a, a like from the raw ingredients, the caffeinated version. And then um, it went through an EA process in Germany and then came to the East Coast. So it kind of traveled a lot and I think like it was really hard to get, but that was the one that kicked us off and then continued to taste. And for me, you know, not knowing what I know now, I thought we were going to have, you know, probably like six to eight offerings, but tasting decaf, there really isn't a ton of offerings that meet that criteria of, um, you know, like you, you can't taste that it's decaf. So the second coffee took another like four months and it came from a local person that actually introduced us, Jared from Hasea. And it was a really tasty Honduras coffee. And I think as a founder, my criteria was very rigid in the beginning. And then I understood that like, you know, this top 1% of decaf is probably not realistic. I started to realize, okay, people want something that might be not floral and delicate all the time. They want like an everyday driver decaf as well. And that's what the Honduras offering is. And then one that I'm, I'm drinking now that will come up, uh, that will release soon is probably the most complex decaf coffee I've ever tasted um, that are the same group that helped find the, the decaf that was, uh, that won the U S Brewers cup this, this year. So just really exciting. And it just, you know, it took a lot of diligence and like not giving up of, you know, having that, Oh, it's like still there and chasing it. Um, and yeah, it's really cool to see, the, the the things that are now in the market that weren't there even a couple years ago. Mm. To clarify, the the Brewers Cup winner was up against caffeinated coffees as well, right? I'm just yep. making sure that I understood that right. Exactly. Which is a pretty big deal for any decaf to be recognized on that scale. You know, you mentioned that there there are uh, new products, things that have been progressing in the marketplace, and what's available and what's not. And there seems to be a burgeoning demand for non-alcoholic, non-caffeinated. This is a question I sent you. Are you feeling that? Is that pushing you forward to keep going, that sort of demand for something that's decaf high quality? I mean, do you, are the customers seeking you out because you're decaf specific? Or is it something else that's pushing this forward? Hmm. I think that's a good question. I would say like a year, year and a half ago, I would say yes. But I think there, there was one uh, non-alcoholic bar that opened in Chinatown in LA that uh, unfortunately is closing their doors. I, I think like we might still be a bit early with just alternatives as a, a generality, or maybe like a standalone coffee shop that might be decaf only. But I think especially with what I have been researching with uh, Gen Z, there are new appetite for alternatives in general. 
the stimuli is something the next generation coming up is really focused on and careful about. And that is something that's, you know, exciting for me. I think there's a world, you know, maybe five, 10 years down the road that, you know, there's maybe there people are renting out their daily coffee shop to decaf options. So there's like a night place to hang out or kick it with like a DJ and things like that. But yeah, I think it's still early. The cool thing is people are, it, it, we're really focused on like word of mouth at the moment. We don't have a footprint in person, like at farmer's markets or anything like that. So a lot of it is uh, people talking and sharing and we're up 13% year over year in just overall sales, which to me shows there's like a growth and appetite for new people finding it like a decaf option. And even this weekend I was chatting with uh, someone at like a kid's party that is pregnant that told me, oh, you have a decaf company. Um, one of my friends like introduced me as that. And she really was sharing like, I was like a normal caffeinated coffee drinker and I need coffee, but you know, now I'm shifting to decaf and it's really hard to find, you know, decaf locally. And I was like, oh, sweet. Um, yeah, happy to like um, send you some products and um, see what you think. So I think for me as a marketer, I think of like groups of people as audiences. And the hard thing is, you know, you really can't target like uh, (laughs) very specific people that like drink decaf because it's more like health related or uh, maybe like a caffeine sensitivity. So I, I believe that you know, not only the people that are solely decaf drinkers, but people that are decaf curious, you know, like me that kind of alternate between caffeinated and decaf have, there's a growth in that. And I think there it's multifaceted that, you know, the, the market is growing. There's definitely more demand. I was talking to Eduardo who was in town, who won the U.S. roasting championship. And he was talking about the delay in putting like a container of coffee into the decaf process. He said, usually the turnaround was around six months and now it's delayed in like about nine months, I would say. So there's definitely way more demand and there's a lot of stress on these uh, points in the world, Colombia, Mexico, Vancouver, that do the processing of decaf. So We'll see how that kind of, you know, develops over time. But the interest is definitely there and growing. It's just, we'll we'll see how fast it grows as well. Developing a decaf, I'm in my head, I'm thinking about challenges that I might face. And one being that a lot of samples that I would receive of green coffee wouldn't be decaffeinated. So you'd have to extrapolate the flavor of that and then extrapolate how the decaf processing will impact it. What's the difference for you between finding a coffee, a decaf versus a regular roast? I'm like you where I drink both. And so the idea that I could have a a company that's only selling decaf, I feel like would add a a extra challenging step in trying to figure out what it's going to taste like post decaffeination. Yeah. I had a couple importers like send me caffeinated coffee that said like, hey, here's like the quality of like... X country that we use. And I I just don't find that helpful. Like I just need to like taste the finished product. So whenever there is that option, I just like politely decline because like you said, the, if you have the caffeinated version and the decaf version, they're pretty different from the most part. I, I have been to a couple events that Swiss water has put on that gives you a taste of the caffeinated and decaf version. And that's really cool just as somebody that's trying to learn about the differences in taste because the the two coffees, there is one Ethiopia uh, coffee and then another Colombian coffee. And the most recent Colombian coffee was like a co-ferment, a pretty 
I would call like wild coffee in my opinion, because I think I, well, I know I consume uh, mostly washed coffees. So I'm pretty sensitive to like co-ferments and things along those lines. And the caffeinated version was just like so over the top. And the decaf version was pretty mild. So I was just like, oh, well, I actually, as a consumer, enjoy the more mild version because it kind of turned down the volume on like the co ferment. Needless to say, I, I think the wisdom I've learned is just like, give me the final product. Like, thank you for offering the, the caffeinated version. But for me, I just need to taste it and then also taste it when it lands because, yeah, this is like probably every coffee taster, roaster, like, you know, sometimes those two things don't uh, align and then you're kind of have this whole new experience and then you have to kind of go back and forth. So because like there's very little really good decaf, yeah, I, I just tried to like, stick to like the samples and we're so small. We don't even have like a sample roaster. Uh, we l- lean on like friends in the industry that will uh, sample roast, but I am probably like, there's probably like a lot of resentment with like people that work with me just because I always ask for roasted samples, which is a whole other conversation of like <laughs> a, a accessibility in the market and like how, you know, it's really hard to get roasted samples, but yeah, I always just ask for roasted samples just to cut out us having to borrow a sample roaster. But yeah, that's uh, <laughs> a, a lot in there. But my experience with like getting decaf samples and sometimes the offering of like the caffeinated because yeah, they're pretty different. I mean, decaf, and uh, we mentioned accessibility. I think even for consumers, it's hard to find or even to know if it's available at a cafe or even at my local grocery store. They only have, I think, two uh, at the main grocery store I go to. And I only buy them there because I can't find them at the local roasters in my neighborhood. If they do have them, it's usually in low quantities comparatively. And so that's always a challenge. Uh, Familiar Coffee, I know I've had one other guest on this show that was focused on decaf and that was Talking Crow Roasters and they were up there. Oh, nice. They're super sweet. They're great. Washington at the time and now down in Arkansas, I believe. But yeah, and that was like, but again, the idea, they do both caffeinated and and non, but the idea being that there was this alternative marketplace that they could fit into because it wasn't being filled where they were. Now that you have Familiar running, Long Beach Coffee Club is kind of in the background there. You mentioned your career. You mentioned that there might have been kids at some point on the horizon, I believe. Mm -hmm possibly in existence now yeah have a have a crib have a crib <laughs> like in the, in the background <laughs> i see that leaning up against the wall is trying to figure that out how have you been able to balance you know how has this process worked for you how are you making it work yeah <laughs> um, <laughs> so i'm uh yeah I, I have a toddler i have a two-year-old and then we have another uh kiddo on the way uh at the end of the year so it goes back to just really spending time on knowing what's important for you and creating values. I think for me, I, I I have a lot of interest in many things in the world. So it's hard for me to really focus in. Um, and I, I think that probably there's like a shared value there with a lot of people that want to start like businesses or, you know, new clubs or you know whatever it may be so finding balance is is helpful and i learned that through working at a danish startup based in copenhagen and i I worked there three years and at a startup you're you're doing a a lot of different tasks was leading you know almost like more than a half a dozen people at the time and then trying to run the u.s operations And at that time, like learned how to time block, which is like a weekly practice that I do and try to just be intentional with my time, but also, you know, not be too rigid because, you know, it can go either way, right? You can go on one side of the ditch that you're so rigid that you miss opportunities and you miss kind of things that you should maybe consider more. 
And then on the other side where you say yes to everything and then you're sitting face to face with someone you don't know that has an agenda that really doesn't align with you. So I think like over the years, that is a big thing. And then I just love different people from different walks of life or perspectives. So I am always, you know, one foot in with like people that love the Premier League and sports and then another foot in on like people that play Magic the Gathering and then another group that, you know, might just be really into pickleball or something like that. But I think with all of those different communities that I'm part of, I really get, you know, not just an echo chamber of people that like everything that I like, even in the coffee industry where, you know, it can be an echo chamber at, at the time. So I think just being intentional and thinking through where I spend my time, but also just trying to create space for, you know, unique spontaneity, which is very challenging. <laughs> <laughs> Your other career is in marketing. How important do you think it is, or how much of an advantage do you think it is to have that background in trying to do what you're doing now, launching this company that is direct to consumer? I think of other small startups in the coffee space, and it feels like they either have a lot of money dedicated towards marketing, but maybe not so much to the other half of the business, or no money dedicated to marketing because they're so focused on the quality and, and the process. Where do you fit into that? Because it seems like you have a little bit of both worlds there. Yeah, so I'm kind of in the middle. In the beginning, I thought my experience was going to be gangbusters and <laughs> I think probably overestimated, to be honest. Like, I was just like, oh, yeah, like I know how to do Google ads. I know how to target on Facebook and Instagram. I can leverage ads on um, Amazon. Uh, but it became very evident that I needed to really solidify the brand before I started doing product marketing. I get a ton of ads from bigger companies like Onyx and Blue Bottle, and they have very deep pockets, but they already have established brands so they can go the product route and say, hey, we have this new Panama or whatever, you know, the subscription you should consider. There's definitely some advantages, but I think like it all comes down to your brand. Um, and that's where I would say that probably the biggest advantage lies with someone that has marketing experience because I'm by trade a performance marketer. So I look at, you know, things like ROI and ROAS and um, but most of performance marketing, I would say all of it is just you need to have an established brand or have something in the market that then you can target specifically and leverage that where, you know, going back to what I said originally is just like, there's not like a targeting feature in these social networks that are, you know, this person drinks decaf, you know, there's interests and things like that. So even with Google, which is more like intent uh, marketing, focusing on like the small amount of people um, nationally that type in a query like specialty decaf coffee, they're, you're going up against Stumptown and Intelli and all of these you know huge companies where people feel more com comfortable to try it. So yeah, I think it's definitely, there's some advantages of it, but I would say the advantages w would come, you know, maybe a year or two from now, if the brand really establishes itself to a household name, and then that's where I can kind of use my skill set. But, you know, I've learned so much about, you know, what people care about and, and still learning on like, you know, what are the coffees people are looking for and are trying to replace or get alternatives. The, the U.S. Brewers Cup that really opened the door to a lot of coffee people in the specialty industry talking about decaf and trying decaf. So I think that is like a gateway into, you know, there's some appetite, you know, even for people that might have been the death before decaf people, you know, so <laughs> there's still 
you know, I'll try decaf. I can drink coffee at night, you know, uh, kind of vibe. So I, I think it's, uh, it, it's definitely growing and exciting to see, but I don't think it's at the market saturation that I thought it was, but it's the biggest segment of the market that's growing because it's been so small. Well, and decaf is up against an entire world. It's not up against just coffee. It's up against any other non-alcoholic drink uh, as opposed to coffee. And coffee is up against those two, but coffee is fairly established as like a morning. You wake up, you have a cup of coffee. That's a thing. But the idea that you could drink decaf at any time of day, but especially at night, even myself, who has spent a lot of time talking and engaging with coffee people, didn't really start thinking about decaf as an option for me in the afternoons until much, much later into this this process. Because in the afternoons, I'd have a cocktail or I'd have a, a hot tea or something else. It just wasn't, it wasn't thinking coffee because it's so identified with mornings. You mentioned that you've learned so much. I'm wondering if you have any advice you'd like to pass along to someone else out there listening, thinking about maybe taking on a challenge of their own in an entrepreneurial space. Yeah, I I think like for me, I'm a big vocal person on like dreaming. I think everything starts with like dreaming as big as you can, even if it sounds like it's not possible and then doing it with care. I think like if I was talking to myself at the beginning of this journey, like I, I didn't need to like lie or fake it till I make it. Like I found myself, especially with Long Beach Coffee Club, trying to be that expert for everything where I was still learning. And, you know, after I was like vulnerable with the group and then understood my position, I really moved into a facilitator that really helped the group grow. And then also me realizing like my position, even as a founder, right? Like I'm not the person that is roasting the coffee. However, I am very, like, I'm a very hands-on founder where I'm tasting everything. This uh, Colombian coffee that we're going to release soon is a coffee that um, we do, you know, different roasts and I'll taste it and give feedback and we'll have a good conversation, the roaster and I. So just really like know what's important for you. And because quality is so important, I taste everything before it goes out. I think like the values point of, you know, what's important to you. And in that way, you know what to stick to. If you don't have values set up, then you're going to probably change a lot and kind of be pushed around. And I've definitely gone through that part where I really just lacked the that structure and the values really helped there. Yeah. And then I think at the end of the day, the coffee is, is a people business and people such a, like a, a common thing, but I remind myself, especially with coffee fest where we got to meet briefly, just seeing like all of the people I've met over the years. And it's like a reunion and, mm-hmm. you know, from New York or Columbia or all over, you know, it's wow. Like good to see you guys. And because of those long lasting relationships, it's really helped kind of grow my journey. And I shifted a lot um, during that, the, the years I've been uh, a part of it. If you're out on the road, you're headed to another coffee fest somewhere and you stop into a cafe that seems like they, they care, they give a shit about their coffee. What are you going to order? So if I'm on the road, uh, we're, we're going up to uh, Cambria uh, in like Santa Barbara area. So I usually like what I'll do there is I'll do a filter coffee, uh, potentially two if there's like options, and then an espresso. I do the espresso. Uh, it was a, a struggle to become an espresso drinker. I saw all of the baristas I would hang out with always do espresso. And then I was just like, okay, the cool kids are doing it. Let me try to <laughs> like get into espresso. And it's, I don't know, it's like drinking whiskey neat or anything. It t- takes a while. And then I, I, I came to appreciate it, but not to the point where I'm going to invest thousands of dollars in the home setup. But I do enjoy it um, because it's something that I can't do at home. And for me, that's really intentional because 
I am really lazy and I don't want to spend <laughs> an hour dialing in and cleaning up and doing those things. I'm happy with my pour over at home, but that's usually my go-to like filter in an espresso. If they have different filter coffees or pour overs, I'll, I'll get a couple just to compare. Um, and then if my wife's with me, she'll usually do like a milk based drink that's seasonal. So I'll get some insight into that. Yeah. And if it's like a neighborhood coffee shop that I go to all the time, it's usually just a filter coffee. Is there a Long Beach coffee shop that we should know about for the next time we're visiting Long Beach? Oh, there's a, there's a lot. I like hanging out at a coffee shop that it's their second location. It's called Sala. And it's uh, Derek does a great job there bringing in interesting coffees. And then I would say uh, Gusto Bread. They started their own coffee program. Um, I met Arturo, who does like amazing um, sourdough and Latino inspired pastries. And their coffee program is great. Jose and the team there is doing a wonderful job. And I really love Rose Park. Rose Park is one of the, like the OG coffee shops that, you know, Andrew and Nathan have been doing it for a long time. Their fourth street location is probably my favorite. And it's just kind of like that cozy Northwest kind of Seattle coffee shop that you can kind of bring a book into and read. Their coffee's terrific. Well, thank you for that. The only place I could tell people to go to in Long Beach, uh, which I think is still there, is the V Room, which does not serve good coffee. But oh yeah, that was on like True Blood, right? <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I've never seen the show. Oh okay, yeah, I th- I think that was the one that is uh, w- was on that show. But yeah, yeah, yeah. it's cool. It's right yeah. down the street from my house. <laughs> yeah, the V Rooms where you go to watch Law and Order in the middle of the day, and then when you come out, it's dark out, and you didn't realize the day had gone by. That's the kind exactly. of bar that is. Yes, yes. Uh, Matthew, I really appreciate you spending forty five minutes with us on the show. I'm sure there's a million more things that we can learn about decaf, and over the next couple of years, I hope that we get to share that. Uh, congratulations on familiar coffee and for taking a, an interest in a corner of specialty coffee that is growing and that people are learning more and more about. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me, Ryan. This conversation flew by uh, <laughs> and uh, it was a lot of fun. Let's stay in touch. And I hope that um, if anybody listening has any questions about decaf or just coffee in general or starting a new project, being an entrepreneur, please reach out because I think um, it's very lonely (laughs) to be an entrepreneur (laughs) and starting things. And I'm happy to try to give some uh, of the things I've learned along the way that I will hopefully continue to learn. So, yeah. Secretly in my head, I know this is people think of this as a coffee show. I mostly think of an entrepreneurship show, but I also for myself think of it as a mental health show (laughs) because being an entrepreneur is is challenging to your mental health in a million different ways (laughs) definitely yeah i think there's there's part of me and this is might go to like the what's in the future the the portion of you know creating time in an experience uh, around a decaf coffee and then being mindful in that moment. And I think it goes hand in hand. I don't know exact. It's in my mind. So that's one of those dreams that might be far out there, but I think that's probably where I'm going. And it might look like in the middle of the woods, brewing a coffee and then having some mindful conversation there, or it might look very different. So We'll see. And I'm excited to like try to extrapolate what's in my mind. And I think that's one of the most interesting and special things about creating something from scratch or just creating like being in a new segment is there's no really road. So you're blazing it as you go and building the bridge as you go kind of saying. And I think that is the thing that, you know, keeps me going, you know, going back to that original question of why do you keep doing it? It's just (laughs) something new. It's, it's, It's cool. Okay, some quick key takeaways from the podcast today. Matthew is living a double life, well, a triple life, really. He's a marketer for a major corporate tech company by day, busy being a family man all of the time, 
and launching his specialty decaf coffee brand, Familiar Coffee, in what little free time he still has. Upon moving back to Long Beach after some time in Arizona, he was searching for community. The welcome he received in some local specialty coffee shops inspired him to launch the Long Beach Coffee Club to further his own exploration of coffee, but also to create a network of coffee friends who could learn from each other, not to mention the industry professionals who found value in engaging with passionate coffee drinkers. But at some point he did have to ask, could this be a business? Could he continue offering so much of himself to the project? The answer was no. Long Beach Coffee Club had to evolve to fit in with Matthew's life. Enter his next project, Familiar Coffee, which is a direct-to-consumer specialty decaf coffee brand centered around a few core values. Quality, functional, informative, and elegant design, and customer service. His decaf exploration began with trying decaf versions of coffee from roasters carrying caffeinated coffees that he already enjoyed. But the quality didn't seem to be translating over, at least not in any consistent basis. Familiar's first offering was from black and white coffee roasters, after which it was off to the races. Just kidding. It took four months of cupping samples to find a second decaf that met the standard he was trying to set with Familiar Coffee. Many entrepreneurs are, by nature, curious, which leads them down many paths. Finding the right ones to focus on can be a challenge, even a roadblock. Matthew is someone whose curiosity takes him down a lot of roads. And what he's learned is that there has to be passion, resources, and the necessary skills in that area to find success. Not to mention, I'd say, the ability to balance the business into the rest of your life. Especially if that new venture is a side hustle, as familiar coffee has started out as. And speaking of life balance, is pickleball dead? I feel like there are no lines at the courts I walk past anymore. Finally, I'm left with a quote from Matthew from near the end of our chat that I'm going to print out and post right here in the booth. It goes, Everything starts with dreaming, as big as you can, even if it sounds like it's not possible, and then doing it with care. That's pretty wise. If you're headed down the path of entrepreneurship and feeling a bit cold from loneliness, don't hesitate to reach out to Matthew Torres at FamiliarCoffee.com. He's been there. That's our show for today. You can find a longer recap in our newsletter at roastwestcoast.com, and be sure to check this podcast show notes. All the links you might be looking for are probably there. And if you're listening on Apple or Spotify, we appreciate if you tap the follow button, or give us some stars, as many as you think we've earned. Or if you're more of an analog person like me, tell a friend about this show. It really helps. I'm always telling my friends about Roastar Coffee Packaging, found at roastar.com. They are this podcast's presenting sponsor, and will help you tell the big story of your small business. They've been an incredible support in enabling us to develop this platform, and they have a pretty impressive new design lab for anyone looking to DIY their packaging. I'm a big supporter and believer in working with great graphic designers, but if you're not quite ready for that, the design lab on roastart.com is an excellent place to start. This show is also supported by some great coffee industry partners, including Zumbar Coffee and Tea, the very first place that I ever had a cup of coffee in San Diego, Morea Coffee, and Cape Horn Green Coffee Importers. Crossings Coffee and Hasea Coffee Source have long been part of our Coffee Smarter efforts, and we've also received support from Ignite Coffee Company, Ascend Coffee Roasters, Civets Roasting Machines, Me and My Uncle Coffee, Relative Coffee Company, Cozy Canine Coffee, and Craft 42 Coffee Roasters. Aaron and Taylor from Craft 42 will be on this show for a pop-in in a few weeks. Thank you to everyone for voting yesterday, for listening to and sharing this podcast, for asking coffee questions, and generally being coffee curious. This show, the Coffee People Podcast, is part of the Roast West Coast Coffee Network, and this episode is, was, has been written, produced, researched, and recorded by me, Ryan Wolt. Wherever you find yourself today, I hope it's with a fine cup of coffee. Thank you for listening to us tell the stories of coffee people. Cheers, everyone. If you are in the early stages of your coffee journey, we want to support you. 
check out the Coffee Smarter Education Podcasts. Coffee Smarter is designed to enable coffee drinkers to brew a better cup of coffee at home. And Coffee Smarter Pro covers industry-specific topics for baristas, roasters, shop owners, and aspiring coffee professionals. You'll find both shows on your favorite podcast platforms or on our website at coffeesmarterpodcast.com.